So today I have the pleasure to uh, present you this book, which was published in Paris in 1920, uh, right after the 7th in September or October in Paris, uh, mostly against the 7th treaty, precisely, uh, which the author considered, as you said, unfair and unwise. So I'm um, that as an introduction to make a general presentation, and after that, I will uh, make the main parts of my lecture. The author first. Gaston Gaillard was born in 1875 and died in 1959. He is author of 24 books and booklets, the last one being published in 1958, one year only, uh, before his death. He has an original career, a national trajectory. Uh, initially, he was educated as a scientific, more, exact, more precisely as a chemist. Then he gradually shifted to anthropology and gradually became a journalist specialist on foreign uh, relations issues, uh, particularly, as I will mention again, uh, from the cultural angle. In 1920, when he published the book we are discussing today, he is in the middle of his professional life and of his life in general. And I would like to already emphasize one thing. During the war, he published not less than seven books and booklets during and right after the war, six of them being against Germany, particularly from the cultural angle, just a few examples, uh, culture, culture, and culture, German name to oppose the uh, Western European and German conception of culture, Judaism and culture, to say that the true Judaism should be on the side of the Entente and against Germany, emphasizing German anti-Semitism, for example. So he uh, devoted most of his time during the war as to make patriotic propaganda, not propaganda in the most pejorative sense of the world, but he participated to the, he particip took part to the war of words against Germany. And also, but I will uh, give much more precisions later, uh, he was interested uh, during the war in the Russian component of the conflict. It was the beginning of his interest for the question we are discussing today. But for now, let's emphasize it is his only book out of 24, which was translated into English. And this is also translated as early as 1921, in summer, published in summer 1921, according to what we see uh, among the differences between the original and the English translation. And the only book published in French defending the Turks during the Turkish War of Independence, which was translated into this language. We can start very basically by this originality, this specificity of the book out of the production of Gaillard and out of the production defending the Turks at that time. It is true that the English publisher, uh, London publisher of Gaillard, uh, was uh, publishing mostly scientific books. And as I told you, he was a scientific by education. So most probably uh, he used his scientific network to be published, but most probably there were other sources because Gaillard was supported, supported by who? The first indication is once again from the publisher, but the French publisher this time. His book was published by Chaplot. Chaplot does not exist anymore today. Almost nobody heard about this house, but it was under the complete control of the French general staff at that time. Initially, the full name was Librairie Militaire Chaplot, military publisher Chaplot. It's quite simple. And uh, this house not only published books of military history and military technique, but also publish reviews controlled by the general staff. And as far as, I bo as books are concerned, just to give you one example, uh, in 1920, the same year as uh, Gaillard, they published a book on German military by General Edmond Buat. Buat was purely and simply the chief of the French army from 1918 to 1923. You cannot imagine more unofficial than that. But this is not a surprise. Why? Because during the Balkan Wars, Chaplot had published the diary of a French citizen 
uh, in Edial Ney, uh, mentioning the war crimes of the Bulgarian army. And more generally, uh, there were several books published uh, during and after the Balkan War to describe the misdeeds of the Balkan, Balkan coalition, including by military controlled publishers. And this is the same during the Turkish War of Independence. Kestongaya's book is not isolated. Another strong and erudite defense of the Turks by Jean Schlickland was published by Berger de Vaux, which was also at that time under the control of the general staff. So what does it prove? That there was a network inside the state apparatus and primarily inside the military, considering that the dislocation of the Ottoman Empire was against the French interest and that the French public opinion had to be learned by this kind of erudite books, both during the Balkan Wars and during the Turkish War of Independence, which were separated by only some years, which makes perfect sense. There's a few examples uh, in this regard. During the Turkish War of Independence, the Turks were supported by Marshal Hubert Lyoté, who was a general resident in Morocco, and the chief of the French Navy's uh, intelligence service, Henri Rollin, was constantly advocating reconciliation with the Turks, arguing that the Greeks don't deserve to be supported. And the Armenians, in his view, did not deserve to be supported, at least the Republic of Armenia and the Nationalists. A last remark in this regard, if you look in the diary, which was published seven years ago, of General Edmond Bua, in the diary of the chief of the French army, in November 1920, he said, we always had interest in not offending the Turks. And he sees the perspective of the destruction of the self-treaty as something not problematic at all from, a strictly, uh, from the strict point of view of the French interest. November 1920. So we can safely say that he may have been supported for the English translation by his friends in the French state apparatus and especially in the military. But there is another possible source from January 1922 to July 1923 during the whole existence of the journal. Gaillard was the editor of a review funded by uh, the son of Delhi uh, Esad Pasha from uh, high ranking Ottoman officers and of an Egyptian princess who wanted to uh, spread knowledge among the French elites. So, uh, during a discussion, uh, Mr. Ambassador Kerich suggested that it could have been the other source of support. This is the only idea I'm presenting, which is not mine, so I want to. So, this general presentation to show you that he is not isolated, and this is not his first book, far from that, to see the book in its context. So, we can discuss the content of the book. I will discuss that in four parts. Third, the vision of the Turks in general. Then the importance of the Turkish barrier against communism and against Russian expansion in general. Third, the opposition of Gaston Gaillard to the Greek and Armenian nationalist claims. And the fourth part will be about the reception and the posterity of the book. How it was received in the French, but also Anglo-Saxon Indian uh, public opinion and how the more contemporary Turks uh, use the books today until this year, actually. First, uh, the vision of the Turks in general. Gaston Gaillard devotes the beginning of the book to a short history of the Turkish people, not only in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, but also in the Caucasus and Central Asia, but I will focus mostly on the Ottoman Turks, of course. And he uh, opposed very clearly the prejudice against Turks in the Western public opinion. I'm I have to quote a sentence in this regard. After all the internal conflict between some of these elements, the non-Muslim elements of the empire, the quarrels with other foreign elements and the keen rivalry which existed generally, each section seems to have held the Turk responsible for whatever wrong was done, and the Turk was charged with being the cause of all misfortunes, almost in the same way as the Jews, Interesting parallel. The Turks have become, as it were, the scapegoats. This is one of the first uh, remarks in his book and the representative of the volume in general. He also refutes the very common allegation of religious intolerance uh, 
accusation uh, against the Turks. He quotes observers of 17th but also 19th century proving that this is completely unfair, that the Ottoman Empire was more tolerant in 17th century than months of the Christian Europe. And as late as 19th century, the non-Muslim communities were autonomous and respected. So from the beginning, he completely opposed the religious hostility uh, to the Turks. He also makes some presentation of the Turkish leadership. I will not, of course, uh, detail one by one, but just two of the most recent uh, Ottoman leaders. He deals with Enra Pasha, committing some inaccuracies. He exaggerates uh, his uh, German orientation. Enra was more pragmatic than Germanophile. Gaia does not uh, render justice to him completely, but he is very far from demonizing him. And he is more accurate on Talat, which is after all, after all logical, because Talat was more French-oriented than German-oriented until uh, 1914. Concerning uh, the situation of the Ottoman Empire and the Turks at the end of the war, uh, Gaillard makes the following remark. It will be a great mistake to look upon Turkey as of no account in the future, and to believe that the nation can no longer play an important part in Europe. So this is an implicit criticism of the military clauses of the Sèvres Treaty, which will use the Ottoman army to something completely ridiculous and unable uh, to fight in war. But this is also a fair appraisal of the Ottoman contribution to the uh, German efforts during the First World War. I don't have time to uh, quote everything Gaia said in this regard, but Gaia understood the quality of the Turkish Ottoman uh, military, of the Turkish soldiers. And actually, this is a rather common subject of knowledge among the French officers at that time to say that the Ottoman army was still efficient, especially at the Ch Chanakale uh, battle. And depriving the world from this military would be unwise, impossible, and a uh, bad idea by every aspect. So Gaia uh, is the representative of this opinion. So this was, this were general remarks on the honesty uh, of the Turks and uh, its capacities as a warrior. More particularly, during the, concerning the entry of the Ottoman Empire in the First World War, Gaia does not justify this choice completely for obvious reasons, but he explains in detail why the Ottoman leadership had very extenuating circumstances. He recalls that Italy had invaded Libya without any justification. He recalls that the Balkan coalition had uh, taken most of the Balkan territories of the Ottoman Empire without any provocation that the Western power did not prevent that. And he says the mistrust of the Ottoman government, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Britain, was justified. But he does not limit himself to that. He also uh, emphasized that um, the British government was ready to give Istanbul and the Straits to Russia as a compensation for the Russian involvement in the First World War. And he had something which is too little known, that in September 1914, the British government encouraged the Greek government to attack the Ottoman Empire. September. So before the Ottoman Empire actually entered the war. So he says, I don't want to justify the decision, but to be fair, we have to know what happened before November 1914. Something very classical uh, in the book, something uh, that is very fashionable uh, at that time, is the emphasis of the author concerning the French moral and material interest. The French called moral interest the network of schools, which was unrelated at that time. Only the American schools approached this, uh, the importance of the French schools. And the material interest were, of course, the investment uh, in the Ottoman economy and the French share of the Ottoman debt. Because about 60, 60 something percent of the Ottoman debt were controlled by Frenchmen. 
and the Ottoman bank was more a French bank than anything else. And uh, this is something very common from the left to the far right in the French press in 19, 1920 and so on, to say a harsh peace for the Turks is a harsh peace for us. And in this regard, they are only uh, make a synthesis of uh, this criticism against the preparation of the Sèvres Treaty and against the Sèvres Treaty itself. What is much more original uh, in the Turks and Europe is, is recurrent criticism of the capitulations. So very briefly, most of you know about that, but very briefly to remind that the capitulation were the judiciary and tax advantages of the foreign years, as well as a low uh, tax custom for the foreign products. Uh, if you were a foreigner protected by the capitulation, you had your own judicial system for yourself. And if you are French, if you were unhappy by your first instance decision, you could go to a special chamber of the appeal court of Aix-en-Provence. And if you were a foreigner, you did not pay taxes to the Ottoman public treasurer. So, as Gaston Gaillard observed, these advantages could be understood in 16th, 17th century. But by 19th century, it was an instrument of domination. Just uh, a quote in this regard. Is, it must be acknowledged that the capitulations, the extension of which led to the improper interference of foreign nations in the home affairs of the Ottoman state and gave them a paramount power over it, form one of the chief causes of the modern ruin of Turkey by weakening and disintegrating it. You can attribute such a sentence to a Kemalist in 1820-21. Uh, everybody will believe you. And he also insists in another part of, of, of this book in stressing that the various separatist elements, not only the Armenian ones, used the foreign post, because there were foreign post office escaping uh, the Ottoman censorship largely, used this foreign uh, post to spread uh, propaganda and to communicate between themselves. So this is probably one of the most original part of the book for a Frenchman in 1820 to say that the capitulation should be suppressed. It is even more original as a large part of the people, especially the centrists and the conservatives, who uh, opposed the territorial clauses of the Sèvres Treaty, hoped, at least in 1920, that if France uh, prevented these clauses from being implemented, it will be a way to maintain the capitulation at least for a part. As late as 1922, when the Turkish national movement was incomparably uh, stronger than in 1920, uh, a significant part of the people who were firmly supporting the territorial aspiration of Ankara were saying we should not suppress the capitulation, at least not immediately. Uh, we should do like Japan, namely keeping the capitulations as long as the ju judiciary uh, Ottoman system is not modernized, completely secularized and uh, westernized. After that, yes, we can uh, suppress it. The tax exemption uh, were not supported anymore in 1922. I don't know in 1920, but it was probably less popular than the judiciary uh, privilege. So, this is not only the voice of the common public opinion, this is not only the voice of the uh, French military, this is the voice of uh, an original writer, original in the positive sense of the word, of course. So, this is for the capitulations. Quite logically, uh, the book also includes a detailed criticism of the occupation of Istanbul by March 1920. And of the British policy in general, I will uh, mention this criticism of the policy by Gaston Gaillard. He says, he especially blames the club of the Friends of England, quote, they sought in every possible way to increase the number of the adherents of that committee, which was subsidized by the British High Commissioner and was chief M was that the Turkish mandate should be given to England. 
quite logical. We oppose the uh, few uh, Turks who believe that uh, Britain could protect the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire. But beside that, uh, he criticized the project of David Lloyd George and Woodrow Wilson to dismember the Ottoman Empire for ethical reasons. I don't need to uh, enter into the details. You already saw what he thought about the Turks, but also for uh, French reasons, in the sense that he opposed the severity of the Anglo Saxon powers vis a vis the Turks and their laxity vis a vis Germany. It, and this is something very common this time from the communists to the far right to say why the Turks should be more punished than the Germans. It was Germany that invaded Belgium and France, it was not the Turks. And the Anglo Saxon powers told us you cannot an annex Saarland because it is inhabited by a majority of Germans. But they say Greece should, I will discuss that in detail uh, in a few minutes, but Greece should annex Edirne, which has a Turkish majority, and Izmir. So, yeah, yeah, in presenting this kind of arguments, is very representative of the Frenchmen of his time. And also, uh, something that yeah, explains, and most of his contemporary uh, also uh, said, uh, the laxity of David Lloyd George regarding the German reparations. And he says, uh, we cannot be, uh, we cannot uh, speak about uh, alleged Turkish war criminal as long as the German war criminal did not pay for what they did to Belgians and Frenchmen. And one more time, this was very common in 1920. But this is not an anglophobic uh, book, just a quote uh, in this regard. For the so styled imperialist policy of Queen Victoria and or King Edward, fourth, it has been violently criticized, had really kept up the old traditions of British liberalism, and had nothing in common with the greed and cool selfishness of such demagogues and would be advanced minds as Mr. Lloyd George. So, uh, one more time, this is something common in the French public opinion. We are not against the British, we are against the current British government. You will find very similar remark in Claude Ferrer, for example, who always emphasized the fact that he had a lot of British friends. And in this context, who Gaillard recommends to deal with? This time he is less original than about the capitulations. He praise Kemal, he says it as uh, great qualities of leadership. He is a great soldier. He emphasizes the fact that he had disagreement with Enver, Enver being the less liked uh, young Turk leader. It is a powerful argument at that time. But he also recommends to deal with Sultan Vadeli. Because in 1919, 1920, there was still a significant number of Frenchmen who say the Sultanate will not be abolished, most probably not. So we should try to uh, shift the policy of Vadetin from a uh, British orientation to a French orientation. And actually, Vadetin made some statements allowing a certain hope in this regard. Eventually, he remained in the end of Britain, but in 1920, you could honestly think he will not always uh, remain as such. In conclusion to this first part, uh, Gaillard emphasize that the Western power should not commit in 1912-1913, in, in 1920, sorry, the same award than in 1913-1914, namely the same award than during the Balkan Wars. Because they say during the Balkan Wars, we left the Turks alone in front of the friends of Russia, which pushed the Turks in the arms of Germany. And he says, if we do the same war again, they will again ally Germany, and why not Soviet Russia? So it leads us to my second part, the importance of the Turkish barrier in the eyes of Gaia. This is not something extremely original uh, in the French public opinion at that time in 1920, because uh, after the defeat of Anton Denikin, uh, one of the main uh, white Russian uh, military leaders, defeat uh, at the end of 1919, you see an increasing number of French journalists from very various uh, 
political positions advocating uh, such an idea, uh, such a Turkish career against communism as, as early as January 1920. But what is much more original in Gaillard is the fact that he had such a position before, in the sense that in a booklet he had published in 1919 on the communist and the non-Russian elements of the previous uh, Russian empire, he expressed a deep distrust for the Russian national culture. This is not racist, it, does, it has nothing to do with blood or genetics or anything like that, but he says the traditional Russian culture is uh, a field for communism. It's not a coincidence if the ideas of the communist ideas are popular in Russia. So he is not a Russophile at all. So he does not trust uh, most of the Russians in general. It was much more the Turkic people and the North Caucasian uh, people. I will uh, explain more in detail in some minutes. So anyway, uh, this is a popular idea uh, in 1920. And one more time, uh, Gaston Gaillard criticized the French policy, the English policy, just a quote in this regard. The English, who are prone to believe only what affects them, did not seem to dread the Bolshevik, Bolshevist peril for Europe, perhaps because they fancied England was quite secure from it. On the contrary, they thought this peril was more to be dread for the populations of Asia, no doubt because it could have an easier access to the English possessions, namely India. But this is a very uh, common grievance to say David Lloyd George did not see the danger of communism and it has a strong factual uh, basis in the sense that the uh, British government provided a very limited help to Poland in summer 1920 when Soviet Russia tried to invade Poland with a very clear, very openly expressed aim to invade Germany. Uh, Marshal uh, Tukashevsky says to us, Warsaw to us Berlin to us Europe. So this uh, criticism of the British policy makes sense. So for Gaia, we should have the biggest possible Turkey, with the territories inhabited by the majority of Turks, to prevent communism from invading uh, southeastern Europe and from reaching the Arab lands. And he insists on the religious dimension of the issue, he insists on the fact that Islam is, according to him, an individualist religion. He does not use individualism in the pejorative sense, he considers individualism to be something positive. And uh, Islam, and more generally the Turkish traditions, are an excellent cultural barrier against the communist ideas. So the conclusion of Gaia is very simple. We should not persecute the Turks, we should not deploy them from their own territories, and we should make an agreement with them. One more time, it is a very uh, popular idea. But he comes further. He discusses Pantuanism. He commits some inaccuracies, but this is the work of a journalist in 1920. This is not the work of a historian having all the available uh, documents on his table. And when he discusses Pantuanism, he does not criticize Pantuanism at all. Implicitly, barely implicitly, he explains that Pantuanism could be useful against the Russian and communist ambitions. And one more time, it makes sense, because the last main uh, white Russian army was destroyed by the Bolsheviks in November 1920. The last remnants were eliminated in summer uh, 1921 and autumn 1922. But in Central Asia, this is not until 1926, then the Bolshevik army uh, stopped fighting organized military units, 1926. And there were still some clashes as late as 1930s. So this is not a stupid idea to suggest that Pantuanism is a bigger barrier against communism than Turkey or. But this is not only what Pantuanism is, as I said, what Islam in general and uh, both in his book, uh, The Turks and Europe, and even more in his previous booklet uh, on the non-Russian element of Russia, he emphasizes the importance of the 
Chechens, Dagestanis, etc. And he deplores that the peace conference did not recognize the North Caucasian uh, Republic. This is more original than the Turkish movie only, but it's not completely unique. Uh, we can make comparison with Henri Franklin Bouillon in this regard, the famous negotiator of the peace with the Turks in 1821, because Franklin Bouillon uh, began uh, to be involved in this issue at the end of 1920. And if you read his first articles and interviews, he does not advocate to support the Turks only. He says we should uh, have a Caucasian barrier, including the reconquest of Azerbaijan and North Caucasia, to have the broader barrier against communism. And considering the fact that the boundaries had moved during the two previous years, that the Bolshevik had heavy defeat, then uh, large victories, and that the fact that uh, Soviet Russia was completely exhausted, in the context of 1920, it was not a crazy project. It was not a utopia. But having been said, uh, Gaston Gaillard does not, is not only interested in Islam in the Turkic world and the North Caucasus. He also presents pan-Islam, pan-Islamism, a very positive way. His definition of pan-Islamism is not political. He says we have to admit the fact that there is a feeling of solidarity among Muslims, philosophical solidarity. He does not believe and. Uh, the next event proved him uh, quite right. He does not believe in any project of a war of a huge theocratic Muslim state from Morocco to Indonesia. I consider it's completely impossible and uh, not supported by anybody. But he says there is a caliphate institution and we should uh, support such institutions and such ideas to prevent communism from being spread in the Arab world and in the Near East. And that's why he uh, deals with such movement uh, in Syria, the Syrian supporters of the Turkish national movement, and even more with the uh, Muslim Indian supporters of the uh, Turkish national movement. And this is not completely isolated in France in 1920, far from that. First, uh, in May 1920, uh, there was a socialist congress against the Sèvres Treaty. It was not named Sèvres Treaty, but everybody knew most of the content with uh, Indian Muslims. But even more relevant is the Congress of June 1920 by more main mainstream politicians, such as an Senator Anatole de Monzy, or a man uh, of the big business, Paul Bordari, against one more time, the Sèvres Treaty, and the main uh, guests were Muslim Indians. To show them we are with you, France is with you, and we uh, strongly encourage the French government to not sign such a shameful, unfair, and unrealistic treaty. So when Gaillard deals in detail, I don't have time to quote you the wall pages he devotes to that, when he deals in detail with uh, uh, pro turkish tendencies in India, this is not only because he wants to study the British policy, this is also because in France, in general, the elites, which were against the Soviet Treaty, were in close touch with the Muslims of India, which is something I, I think too uh, little known and which uh, deserves uh, much more attention in the scholarship. And actually, uh, like some participants uh, of the June 1920 uh, conference, I, I mean uh, Claude Farrer especially, Gaston Gaillard will regret in 1924 the suppression of the caliphate uh, by uh, Kemal Ataturk. He said it was an institution, it was a symbol. Probably he did not understand sufficiently uh, the fact that the caliphate was a point of convergence of all the anti-secular opposition to the Turkish Republic, but this is true that the Ottoman Caliphate was a, had a moderate, inf moderating influence on Islam in general, and which is true that it is something missing uh, today. So his reasoning is not uh, completely uh, absurd in this regard. So. And uh, now uh, moving to my uh, third part, 
which is a criticism of by Gaillard of the Greek and Armenian nationalist claims, territorial claims mostly, against the Turks. So I will begin with the Greek claims. And as I did previously, I'm going to quote uh, a short part. Indeed, no good reason could be given in support of this decision to allow the Greek landing in Izmir. By the help of misleading or false information, cleverly worded and widely distributed by your propaganda, which overwhelmed the press, was only equaled by the propaganda carried out by Poland political manoeuvre, induced the Allies to allow Greece who wished to become greater Greece and wanted Epirus, Trace, Constantinople, Smyrna, Trabzon, and Adana to occupy, and that's not true, uh, to occupy a region belonging to Anatolia, where the Turkish element predominates more than all the rest of the Ottoman Empire, for there are only 300,000 Greeks against about 1,300,000 Turks. So this quote summarizes almost everything, and this quote is completely accurate in the sense that the Turks are the large majority everywhere in Western Anatolia and Eastern Greece. In the fact that the propaganda was completely false and misleading, and actually Gaston Gaillard provides a strong evidence in this regard, the report of the uh, Anglo-American French-Italian Commission saying that uh, the so-called orders to kill Christians were fakes. There were fake documents spread in the Western press at that time. For example, by René Pio, who uh, was paid by the Greek government since the Balkan Wars, at least. This is something I am adding for your understanding. It's not something in Gaston Gaillard's book, but it helps to understand uh, his remarks. So, <clears throat> with this is something very common uh, in the French public opinion at that time to emphasize the fact that there was no persecution of Greeks, no slaughter of Greeks even during the First World War, and that the Turks had the large majority, so the Greek claims were against all realities. It's, it's unrealistic as well as unethical. So, not, not, a lot of, not a lot more uh, things to say, this is uh, accurate and very common in the French public opinion. But something much more original uh, is, is emphasized on the Greek anti-Semitism, uh, especially the Greek economic anti-Semitism. He gives the, precedent, the example of the precedent of Salonika, conquered by the Greeks in 1912, and where the Jewish and foreign uh, economic uh, activities were diminished, strongly diminished, by various measures of persecution, discrimination, and so on. So this is true. Greek anti-Semitism was particularly high at that time. All the studies on the uh, blood libel, uh, the false accusation of ritual murders by Jews, proved that the Greek community was the most represented among the slanderers. And all the studies on uh, Christian anti-Semitism in the late Ottoman Empire uh, demonstrate that the economic component uh, was very important and the fact that the Jewish traders were uh, more honest uh, than most of the Greek traders only uh, incited a uh, certain number of them to uh, spread this kind of slanders and to uh, attack them uh, unfairly on the economic field as well. Why this originality? I'm not completely sure, but what I can say uh, for sure is that uh, Gaillard was among the few French journalists in 1920 to write about the Russian anti-Semitism, especially the anti-Semitism of the white Russians during the civil war. And he was praised by the Jewish uh, newspaper, Lumière Israelite, in January 1920. So he had this sensitivity. And as I quote uh, some minutes ago, he uh, emphasized the similarity between the anti-Turkish and anti-Jewish prejudice. So, this is, uh, all this is very uh, current. And quite logically, uh, he criticized one more time the British policy, just a quote in this regard. 
Mr. Lloyd George had already granted to Turkey the possession of that region, Eastern Trace, on January 5, 1918, when he had solemnly declared, nor are we fighting to deprive Turkey from its, of its capital or of the rich and renowned lands of Asia Minor and Trace, which are predominantly Turkish in race, end quote. And he had repeated this pledge in his speech of February 25, 1920. So this is a very clever attack to uh, oppose to Lloyd George his own statements. And uh, Gaston Lea also quotes a later statement of Lloyd George when he uh, welcomed Muslim Indians uh, asking him to uh, maintain Eastern Trace in Turkey. And when he says, no, no, uh, it has a Greek majority, so we have to give uh, Eastern Trace to, uh, to Greece which is not only false, but one more time, again, against what Lloyd George himself had declared earlier. So, I'm uh, shift, moving to the Armenian uh, claims. And the Armenian issue is not something completely new uh, in the production of Gaillard, because in the previous booklet he had published in 1919, on Russia. He had criticized the main Armenian nationalist party, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, because of its tactical alliance with the Bolsheviks and also because of the slaughters of Azeris, something which was not uh, widely uh, known uh, in the French public opinion in 1919 at least. And <coughs> Sorry. My apologies. So this is not something new for him, but he goes much further into the details and he gives uh, to his readers the historical depth of this issue. He rightfully observes that this issue uh, started in the 1850, 1850s in the context of the Crimean War, when Russia started to send agitators to Ottoman Armenians. He always emphasized the fact that this hostility between Armenian and Turks is not something uh, old, it's something that dates back 19th century, before the Russian intervention, before some British so-called Armenophil uh, incited them, there was no conflict, which is historically true. He mentions the uh, rebellion of Satan uh, in 1862, which is actually the first uh, Armenian nationalist rebellion. He mentions the fact that uh, during the bloody events of 1890s uh, in, in Eastern Anatolia and Istanbul, as well as in Adana in 1909, there were uh, killed civilians from both sides, not only Armenians killed by Kurds and Turks, but also Kurds and Turks killed by Armenians. And something also uh, more original, he details the Russian repression of 1903-1908. He does, he does not limit himself to the Russian incitement. He also says Russia was much harsher for the Armenian church, at least in 1903-1908, than the Ottoman state ever was. The Ottoman state never confiscated the properties of the, Ottoman, of the Armenian church, something that was done in 1903-1908. And I think it is a remark that is still quite relevant uh, in the debates today. <laughs> and another uh, interesting uh, contribution of Gaston Gaillard to the knowledge of his contemporaries and also to our knowledge today is uh, the pages on the 1912-1914 years, when Russia raised the Armenian issue one more time ask for reforms which were actually the, an autonomy to an Armenia that did not exist because as he emphasized there was no Armenian majority in any province in any vilayet so what, what autonomous Armenia you are asking for this is not Crete this is not Lebanon and beside that uh, 
He mentioned the participation of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation to the Bulgarian war efforts against the Ottoman Empire in 1912-1913, something that is confirmed today even by Armenian nationalist scholars such as uh, Richard Ovenician in the US or Gates Minassian in France. And he also mentioned something that is too little known even today, namely the project of the Anshak party to assassinate uh, Committee Union and Progress leaders. So all these facts are uh, mentioned by Gestoleya to prove that the rebellions of 1914-1915 did not emerge from nowhere and we are not rebellions of a completely oppressed people far from that. I would like to quote a very uh, accurate and very interesting uh, remark he made about 1914. Yet these committees, Dashnak and Chak Ramkava, carried on their activities separately and sent instruction to the provinces that if the Russian advanced, all means should be resorted in order to impede the retreat of the Ottoman troops and to hold up their supplies. And if, on the contrary, the Ottoman army advanced, the Armenian soldiers should leave their regiments from the, form themselves into groups and to go over the Russians. This is exactly what happened. We can see that in the uh, books and articles of Edward Erickson, for example, the collective book of Justin McCarthy and others on the Army Rebellion Advance, and so on. He describes the rebellion in Erzurum, Bayezet, etc. And he provided a quote that I regret uh, is not uh, very often used. It is actually very, very, very used, I regret. It's a quote from Aram Manoukian, who was one of the main leaders of the uh, Armen Rebellion at Van. It's uh, during uh, an event um, in his honor in 1915, after the success of the Armen Rebellion at Van. He says that to the Russians. When we was one month ago, we expected the Russians would come. At a certain moment, our situation was dreadful. We had to choose between surrender and death. We chose death, but when we no longer expected your help, it has suddenly arrived. I would like to stop one minute on that. He said, I repeat, we had to choose between surrender and death. He did not say we had to choose between victory and death. It implies that he had, the cho he had the possibility to surrender and to survive. And nowhere in his statement, he pretends that his rebellion was self-defense. And this was printed in an Armenian journal in July 1915. This kind of confession, I think, should be used uh, more often. There are not many. Probably in, Ju in July 1915, he believed that the complete victory of the armed nationalists was very soon and he could uh, express himself more freely uh, than later. But uh, it's a very significant contribution of Gaston Dea, I think, to have uh, found uh, this quote for the knowledge of his contemporaries and for our knowledge uh, today. Uh, Gaia is very really honest uh, uh, also when he makes a kind of mea culpa regarding the Armenian losses, because he says, I used in 1916 the figure of 800,000 uh, Armenian who died. It comes from Lord Weiss. And he says, no, uh, this is an exaggeration. It does not provide uh, a figure, an exact figure of his estimated losses, but he says it, it's less than 800,000. And nothing uh, forced him to admit that uh, he had made an uh, inaccurate statement in this regard four years ago. It gives more credibility to his book, I think. When you admit your error, it improves your credibility. But he does not uh, limit himself to uh, the pre war event or to the 1914 1915 uh, tragedy. He also uh, deals with the most contemporary for a video of 1920 uh, events. Um, 
Especially, he uh, provides a detailed description of the effort of James Stewart, who was the nominal leader of the American Committee for the Independence of Armenia, to obtain an Armenia from Karaba to Melsi. And it was unsuccessful because even the government of David Lloyd George found such an Armenia uh, impossible. And an incidental remark, it's not in the book of the year, it's for your uh, understanding. As early as 1919, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs said about this Armenia from the sea to the sea, it's a wonderful project only the Armenians will miss. Namely, uh, they are asking for a territory where there is no or very few Armenians. So this is an Armenia without Armenians, what we are asking for. So, returning to Gaston Geyers, he describes his unsuccessful efforts and, as is not anglophobic, he uh, quotes Lord Curzon, who made a quite accurate uh, statement against the uh, claims of James Gerard in front of the Chamber of Commune. Quote, it must be honored the Armenians during the last weeks did not behave like innocent little lambs, as some people imagine. The fact is they have indulged in a series of wild attacks and proved bloodthirsty people. And if you check in the diary of Avetis Aronian, you find a very harsh discussion between himself and Lord Curzon on this very same subject. And Aronian himself does not dare to deny the British reports. He accused the Azeri reports to be exaggerated. I will not enter into such a discussions, but he admits that the British reports are in conformity with the reality. So this is another uh, interesting point uh, in Gaia's book on the Armenian issue, but it's not the only one on the post-war uh, events, because it also provides us a uh, fair description of the airboard report, something uh, Professor Tichit Kalagin knows better than anybody else here, and uh, a report that provoked the end of the project of a US mandate on Armenia. And his conclusion uh, on the Armenian question uh, in uh, summer 1920 is uh, quite uh, well-funded. Under these circumstances, the conclusion of Gaillard, under these circumstances, the complete solution of the Armenian problem was postponed indefinitely, and it is difficult to foresee all the problem will ever be solved. This is written in August 1920, namely before the crushing defeat suffered by the Republic of Armenia. So it proves a very clear lucidity of the author on this issue, like on most of the issue he deals with. And precisely, uh, his lucidity has been praised by many uh, contemporary reviewers, and it leads us to my fourth and last part, the reception and posterity of his book. A few words of context to begin with. There was an evolution of the French press from uh, in summer, autumn 1919 to become more favorable to the Turkish point of view. Then uh, from December 1919 to February 1920, there is a real turning point uh, with a wave of editorials, articles, and so on against the idea to take Istanbul to the Turks. Many newspapers from the communists to the far right say this idea is unrealistic and completely unfair. And then from February to autumn, uh, October uh, 1920, there is a new wave of articles against the Sevres Treaty. So the book of Gaston Gaillard arrives in a favorable context. As I said, as I emphasized, he's saying a certain number of things that many people in the French press say at that time. And you see favorable reviews in quite uh, different uh, newspapers. Le Figaro, the daily of the center-right bourgeoisie, recommends the book. Say anybody interested in the Eastern issue should read this book. And on the opposite side on the left, you see La Petite République, which does not publish exactly a review, but an extract of the book and this part is on the Armenian issue. On the most sensitive issues, this left-wing daily decides to present to its readers a part of this book with a recommendation. 
It is true that both La Petite Republic and Le Figaro had supported Dreyfus, uh, this officer which was, who was unfairly accused at the end of 19th century. But we see uh, even funnier, if I may say, uh, convergence, because uh, one of the warmest recommendations went from L'Univers Israelite, a Jewish uh, newspaper, and another warm recommendation went from La Libre Parole, which was a far rightist daily. Of course, La Libre Parole did not emphasize the Jewish component of Gaston Gaillard's book, but they approved all the arguments they mentioned which is something I think significant. And beside that, uh, there were more specialized uh, publications, such as Le Semaphore de Marseille, which was a very business-friendly uh, newspaper, which recommended the book warmly. And a monthly La Zie Française, which was the main newspaper of the French imperial interest in the East, as a title uh, suggests. And Lazy Francaise says it is a must read. Uh, the facts proved him right because the review was published some months after it was published. And they say we do not necessarily agree with every sentence. They don't elaborate, but I think they were uh, meaning the capitulations. Lazy Francaise wish to keep the capitulation at least for a part. But this is the basic book on the Turkish issue. In short, that's what uh, Lazi Francaise uh, says. And uh, two other examples uh, on the French press, from the French press, more intellectual references. The Revue des Sciences Politiques, which explains that it is a factually uh, accurate book, and that Gaillard is very wise in underlining that the Wilson and Armenia was dead born, and in comparing the Ewars. Uh, concerning the Turks and the awards concerning the Austrian Hungarian monarchy. Because Gaillard and this reviewer says, we have destroyed the Austrian Hungarian monarchy, which was not a big danger, and doing so, we reinforced Germany. We should not do the same kind of awards. And he completely agree with Gaillard uh, in, regarding this double standard. So, one more time, he, uh, Gaillard was defending ideas which were common at this far apart in the French public opinion. And my last example also from the intellectual field is Le Monde Nouveau, uh, which was uh, made by Frenchmen, uh, British and American oriented, but in spite of their strong support for the British and American alliance, they recommended the book. And just two other uh, references, not from France, but from uh, the British Empire. Not surprisingly, the Near East, the bulletin of the British missionaries was not very excited by Gaston Gaillard's book, but they say it is a careful summary of the events, it will quote, and they, the reviewer does not deny the existence of the 1914-1915 Armenian rebellions. It tries to justify them, but it does not deny them. And he does not deny the slaughter of Azeris in 1920. He tries to find extenuating circumstances, of course, but he does not deny and he does not justify. I think some Anglo Saxon army officials should read this book review. If they had the same position today, it will be at least a bit closer to the truth. And to finish, I will not surprise you uh, in uh, saying that the Islamic review, which was uh, made by Muslim Indians and their friends, publish a very favorable review. This is quite logical. So I described briefly the reception. I would like to say some words uh, about the posterity. The book was mostly rediscovered by the Turks at the end of 1990s. Uh, if you read in the book of Kamal and Gulen, uh, the Armenian five, for example, there is not a single reference to Gaillard, in spite of the fact that Gulen used a lot of books, including French books. The first translation I found uh, was made by Ege University C in 2003, but only the parts of the Armenians. And the first full translation I found was published last year and reprinted this spring. So that's why this uh, webinar, I think, is was relevant with the actuality. In conclusion, briefly, I have tried to present you the book of an honest journalist who uh, defended uh, both common and original views. 
And beside this concrete example, I think in Turkey and in some other countries, it should be more understood that scholarship on the anti-Turkish prejudice in Britain and US is certainly a must. It has been done by various scholars. But research on the books supporting the Turks is not less needed. I have finished. <laughs>